comes and sings for us. You are God alone. <coughs>
Jesus is coming soon, and we're going to be grateful to see that day. We will be saved from sin and death, finally free forever.
What a tremendous gospel message you have given to us to be witnesses of. What a tremendous ministry of reconciliation you have. issued us with. You are the only God who can save. Lord Jesus, I don't know who here tonight is uh, in need of your salvation. Who here this morning has come with a burden? Your word can move mountains. That's what the Bible says. And Jesus, you told us if we have faith in you that you would give us that same ability and authority. All in you. We've gathered here in your name to worship you. We thank you for this time we have to sing praises to you. We thank you for the message that you've so carefully prepared in our pastor this morning. May your words go deep into our heart and may they bear your fruit, not just throughout this week, but for the rest of our lives. We love you, our awesome God, and it's in your holy name that we pray. You may be seated. Spring break starts this week, uh, so I thought it would be appropriate that we have a physics lesson so that you don't lose the taste of school and education for those of you that are that are uh, trying to escape from that as far as you can you know if I were and, and I thought I had a, a ball up here but I think it got uh, removed from me but anyway imagine this ball that's in my hand okay wh wh what color is it Ernie a red ball okay uh, fuchsia red whatever we'll go red uh, his eyesight's not what it used to be it never was much uh, if I take this ball and I set it on the edge of this pew, of this pulpit, my eyesight's not too good either. That's a pulpit. Uh, it's going to tend to stay there. And the reason it's going to tend to stay there is because physics tells us that a, a, a body at rest tends to stay at rest. Unless something comes along, some outside force moves it, it's going to just stay there forever, basically. Also, then, I can pick that red ball up and I can, I can throw it down the aisle here. And if I throw it down the aisle, it's going to start moving. It's going to hit the ground. It's going to start rolling. And you know what physics tells us is that uh, that ball will never stop rolling because a body in motion uh, tends to stay in motion. The only reason it'll stop, and you're saying, oh, I won't even make it to the back door, is because uh, the friction in the carpet, a little bit of the resistance in the air, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Hilterbrand back there jumping out and grabbing it, some outside force, good or evil, will uh, stop it. If we didn't have friction in the carpet, if we didn't have air resistance, uh, it would just keep on rolling. Uh, there, there'd be no reason for it to ever stop rolling. Once it's gotten its inertia, once it's gotten its momentum, it just keeps going. The only thing that stops it is some outside force. And you know, if I throw a ball just sort of barely down this aisle, it'll maybe go halfway. If I really throw it fast, it's going to go a lot further. Because the slower, the less, the least amount of inertia, momentum that it has, the easier it's going to be for the outside forces to stop it. A, a slowly rolling ball will come to a stop much sooner than one that's rolling very quickly. It takes more outside force to make it stop. Now, what does that have to do with anything? Well, that's us, really. When we get to moving for God, when we go from being a body at rest... One that will, if something doesn't happen, we'll just stay and rot. We won't do anything. But when an outside force, when the Holy Spirit of God gets a hold of us and throws us like a bowling ball uh, down through the path that He wants us to go, uh, that momentum 
st that starts with us, that gets going with us, that's started by God, sends us flying, and we won't stop unless some outside force stops us. Once you get momentum going in something, uh, in this world, the, the great challenge becomes keeping that momentum going. Uh, you, you get momentum moving in a certain direction, then you've got to try to keep that momentum going. Uh, if you don't, uh, something will bring it to a stop. You've ever had to push a car. Uh, and you can push a big, big car until you come to a hill. And the, the force of, of gravity starts to work against you. And pretty quickly, uh, you're not able to push it. Uh, some outside force impedes that overall progress. And once we start doing things for God, once the church of God uh, gains momentum, and we begin to move forward for God, the only thing that can stop us is some outside force that wants to impede that progress. When an individual Christian gets on fire for God, but gets that momentum behind them of the Holy Spirit empowering them and, and uh, uh, just encouraging them to do great things for God, the only thing that seems to stop is the friction, the resistance of the world. Or otherwise, the Christian would be unstoppable. And in fact, the more momentum the Christian has, the harder it is for the world to stop. Oh, the Christian that just sort of rolls slowly out into life can be easily stopped. Uh, they might have the excitement and the, the inertia to begin to do some things for God, but they don't ever get the speed of, of really moving on for God, and so outside friction can easily stop them. Well, so much for that. What does that have to do with anything? I see our lives as Christians in light of momentum using the laws of physics in this way. I think life is a roller coaster. Now, we'd all agree with that. Yeah, boy, life has its ups and downs. But here's what I want you to remember about a roller coaster. A roller coaster traverses an entire course uh, of its travel uh, based on just the initial pulse of going down that first ramp off the roller coaster. And the rest of its travel, unless it's one of these that has that little secret stopping point where it starts it again and has to be drug up, in a typical roller coaster, it goes up and it goes down, it goes around curves and up and down, and it will maintain its momentum all through the rest of the course of its travel. And I think that that's exactly how we ought to look at our lives. God sends us forward. We go through that initial impulse, that initial momentum that gets us doing things for God, and what we want to understand is that in that initial surge, God has actually given us the momentum to face the uphills and the refreshment to regain the momentum going in the downhills of our life so that we're able to finish our course. What God gives us is the ability to go up and down. To go through the uphill struggles of our life so that we can go through the downhill struggles. In fact, the way I want you to think about this is if you are going through an uphill struggle right now in your life, in your relationship, in your job, just in your life personally, as a family, whatever it might be, realize that God has given you, the, He designed the ride, okay? And He has given you the momentum to make it up that hill. So much so that, not, notice this, not only are you going to make it through that uphill struggle, but when you make it through, you're going to have a potential for momentum that's going to send you flying through the blessings that God has for you. God brings you through these high, climbing, stressful moments in your life, these struggles, these weeks, these years, these events, because following that, you're going to grow in your faith, you're going to grow in your spiritual maturity, and you're going to find you're going to be coasting. And you're going to be coasting and picking up speed, and there's going to be great blessings, and God is going to enrich your life. But you know what? He's given you all of that for a reason. Not just so you can just enjoy the wind in your face, but because He knows the next hill is coming. And you surpass the one 
in order to gain the momentum you need to get through the next hill, but take heart. God's going to take you to the top of that hill, and then you're going to enjoy the blessings again. So much so that God gives us the momentum, if we'll just maintain it, to make it to the finish line to make it through the full course of what He has us to do. The difficulties in our life is just God building up the potential for the momentum that's about to come. The, the, the blessings in our life is simply God empowering us. If you think about that roller coaster being empowered by increasing speed, empowering us to face the next hill that is inevitably in our path. When we look at the children of Israel having returned under, uh, in the book of Ezra, and we come to chapter 4, we see them in the first five verses, we looked at it last week, meeting uh, the obstacle of discouragement and the powerful obstacle that it was. But the writer of Ezra wants to let the readers know and realize that this book is written some 100 years after these events in the first part of Ezra. It's written to uh, uh, the people after the temple has been rebuilt. At a, at a time of malaise uh, in, in the rebuilding of, uh, uh, of, of, of the place as a whole. The walls still haven't been rebuilt. Uh, Nehemiah has still not done uh, his job uh, that he's going to be called to do. There's still a malaise there. The momentum has been lost. Uh, they've come off uh, the, the downhill blessing, and downhill in this case being the the blessing and the uphill being the struggle, and they seem to have just lost their momentum. And so, in order to encourage that, the writer includes not only the events in the first five verses, which refer to what happened to them immediately upon returning, when they laid that foundation stone, and the people of the land came, the, the folks from Rubble Hill came, and they opposed them. But he also then includes for us uh, and for the, the readers of this uh, first letter uh, that Ezra wrote, uh, events that happened throughout, so that they might be able to look back and to regain the momentum they need to go forward. So it's, sometimes it's good for us to not only be uh, looking forward, but to reflect back on all the blessings that God has given us. There is a push that comes, a, a push to the roller coaster, if you will, of our life, that comes from the encouragement of remembering all the hills we've already gone over. You know, the scariest uh, hill on a roller coaster is the first one. That chain's clanking and that thing's pulling you up to the top. And that first one, you know, by the fourth or fifth or sixth one, everybody's got their hands raised and, and uh, you're kind of getting into it. Well, that's the way it is in our lives. Some of those initial struggles and those initial setbacks, that friction, the, the resistance that we uh, re receive, uh, sometimes those are the most difficult things in our life. But as we go through them, as we regain that momentum, we get the speed back uh, that God has for us. Uh, that potential momentum turns into kinetic momentum, and we begin to move forward for God. Then we can face the next hill and the next hill without ever having to come to a complete stop. Just aware that things are going to slow us down, but inevitably there's going to be blessings that follow that are going to just speed us right back up again. And that's what he wanted to remind him of. Read with me beginning in the 6th verse of Ezra chapter 4. I'll remind you in the first five verses, Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, uh, was the, uh, the, the king of Persia. Uh, he's the one who wrote the decree that let the uh, Israelites return home to rebuild the temple. In verse 6, we are given the names, beginning in verse 6, of some different kings. The first one in verse 6 is, says, And in the reign of Ahasuerus, at the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. Well, this Ahasuerus, uh, which is the king in the book of Esther, uh, is a king uh, 20, 30 years down the road. Uh, Cyrus has been replaced by Cambyses, and Cambyses by Erzeris, which is also Xerxes, X-E-R-S-E-S, -E uh, same king. So now we're including events that happen much later, in, uh, or relatively later in Israel's history. It says that in the days of uh, Erzeris, in the beginning of his reign, 
They wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. There's still opposition. And this time, the opposition chooses to write some letters. Uh, they're writing letters complaining about uh, uh, the way the Jews are doing things, the way the Israelites are uh, uh, conducting themselves in the land that uh, Erzeres at this point is the king over. Then you come to verse 7, in the days of Artaxerxes. Now this is uh, Artaxerxes II, uh, Bilsham and, and Bithretha and Tabeel and the rest of the associates wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And the letter was written in Aramaic and translated. So now we have yet another king who uh, is receiving letters of complaint. Isn't that, isn't that a, a powerful indication of, uh, of the opposition that they have, that somebody would actually write an ugly letter and have it distributed uh, uh, against the work that's going on in Jerusalem? Raham commander and Shimshai the scribe wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, the king, as follows. And it begins to give some of their complaints that they have against the king. And as a result of it, we'll just skip down to verse 17. The king sent an answer to Raham the commander and Shimshai the scribe and the rest of their associates who live in Samaria and in the rest of the province beyond the river, greeting. And now the letter that you have sent to us has been plainly read before me. And I make a decree, and search has been made, and it has been found that the city from of old has risen against kings, and that rebellion and sedition have been made in it. And mighty kings have been over Jerusalem, who ruled over the whole province beyond the river, to whom tribute, custom, and toll were paid. Therefore make a decree that these men be made to cease, and that this city be not rebuilt, until a decree is made by me. And take care not to be slack in this matter. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the king? Then when the copy of the King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shimshai, the scribe and their associates, they went in haste to the Jews at Jerusalem, and by force and power made them cease. Then the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped, and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Well, up until verse 24, okay, we have uh, the events that occur from 30 to nearly 100 years later, and then that is given an explanation for verse 24, which brings us back to verse 5. Actually, verses 6 through 23 become a commentary on the, uh, the conditions that would befall Jerusalem time and time again in their rebuilding. And then we get back to verse 24, we go back to the days of, uh, of Cyrus. And Cyrus is followed by Cambyses, and Cambyses is followed by Darius. And then Darius will be followed by Erzarius. So verse 24, he says, The work of the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped, and it ceased until the second year of Darius' reign, which is 520 B.C. It stopped in 536 or 532 B.C., uh, four years into it, it stops for 16 years, and then they complete it. Why is all this included? Why all this history lesson? Because that there's some important things for us to always keep in mind as we strive to do the work of God. And it really boils down to this physics term, momentum. You know, we can start and gain momentum. Uh, we can... Uh, uh, rededicate ourselves to the work and the task of God. We can devote ourselves to studying His Word, to prayer, to, to a life that's dedicated to listening to God. And all of that helps to gain and build the momentum of service. But we live in a world of friction and resistance. We live in a world where there are outside forces that want to impede and that want to stop. And we have to be careful in our lives that we don't lose the momentum that God has given us. And one of the ways that we understand that is to cast our resistance in the light of history. To realize that the resistance that comes to us as a people, as an individual, as a family, as a church, is nothing new. Okay? It is part and parcel of doing the will of God. In fact, really when you study this, you get the impression 
that would almost be an indicator that you're not in the will of God if you don't get the resistance and the wind and the, the, the pressure to stop your momentum. You know who doesn't have any pressure? You know who doesn't have any friction? Who doesn't have any resistance? That's that red ball that just sits right here on the pulpit. The, the body at rest that tends to stay at rest. Uh, if, if you never engage, you're going to just sit there and you're not going to notice any problems. You're not going to have uh, conflicts in your life. You're not going to have difficulties. Uh, it's when you begin to move forward, when God begins to give you that initial push, when you get that initial momentum in your life and you begin to do things, yes, that's when you feel the wind hitting you. That's when you feel the friction coming towards you. That's when the resistance and the momentum is trying to slow down now because Satan is trying to impede the progress of God. There's things we need to look at in our life that become the friction that wants to slow our momentum. One is you, you dedicate yourself, you rededicate yourself to serve God, to be devoted to Him, and you suddenly find that there are all kinds of outside uh, activities and priorities and pressures that want to bear on your life. I tell you, uh, w when a parent decides that they're going to uh, instill a daily devotional time with their family, a, a time of prayer, a time of just being with their family, uh, you've got to be aware that there is all kinds of friction that's going to suddenly show up in, as you try to travel down that path. That television, that cell phone, that PC, that texting, that ball practice, that band practice. There are all kinds of, in, uh, by themselves, really good things. Listen, carpet is good, okay? Carpet's wonderful, it's nice and soft. It's only friction to the ball that's rolling down it. There are all kinds of things that are in and of themselves, they're neither evil nor good. They just become friction when we're trying to follow the path that God has given us. And if we're not moving very quickly, we'll be quickly swallowed up by that resistance. We'll let a simple extracurricular activity bring us to a stop. We'll, we'll let a, 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 an obsession to watch TV stop us. Uh, we'll, we'll let anything that can get in the way uh, will be sufficient to stop us in our path for God. So we've got to first be aware that there is resistance. There has been in the past. Whenever people have chosen to do great things for God, they've always met opposition. We can look here to Israel. We can look to the days of Christ. We can look to the, uh, the book of Acts with the apostles. We can look to the history of the early churches. We can look to the history of the apostles. And we see tremendous friction going on in their lives. But every time they maintained momentum, let me tell you what happens. When you maintain that momentum and you get through that trial, you get through that testing, you get through that problem, that resistance, your momentum just increases. And it's increasing because God is preparing you not only for blessing, but He's preparing you for the next resistance that's about to come. In the case of the roller coaster, that gravity that wants to slow you down when you're going up. In the case of our lives, that sin, that temptation, that obligation, that overscheduling, that wants to pull us down and take away and sap us from the momentum that God has given us. When it comes to a church, again, we look back to the first five verses and we see discouragement. A guy told me this week, and I, I think it's a, just a real common illustration about Satan having a yard sale and he puts all his tools out uh, for sale and people are coming up and they're buying one, you know, this you know, sin on this and that. And this one guy sees this one tool over here and he asks Satan, uh, you know, how much is this? And Satan says, oh, that's not for sale. That's my most valuable tool. And long story short, that tool was the tool of discouragement. Because that is the most powerful tool. And that's what we see here. That even when God had given momentum to a group of people, such momentum that they left the comforts of uh, where they had been living, traveled four months, came into a land they had never lived in, 
uh, set up shops, set up houses, and begin to lay a foundation. I mean, you talk about momentum building here. Discouragement stopped them for 16 years. And that can happen to a church. The discouraging words of, of uh, outside or inside can have an impact on the momentum that God desires us to maintain. So we always have to be careful about that. We have to be careful about uh, losing momentum because of uh, uh, our personal schedules. Uh, when you're in a, a church, you're in a, a land of volunteers. And uh, people will volunteer and that will be the initial push to uh, their momentum to serve. But because it's not the big push, or because they're not really rolling for God, the, the first outside obstacle and schedule conflict will cause them to come dead in their tracks and to stop, and then that slows the church down. I tell you what, you just put a, a, a brake on one of those wheels of that roller coaster. It may have 50 wheels on it, but you put a brake on one of them and you can keep that thing from going up the next hill. And the, the Bible talks about that in Ephesians, that we're all parts of the body. We don't all do the same thing, but everything we do is important to the whole work of the body. And one of them gets sick, the whole body suffers, is what uh, Ephesians is telling us. And we get displaced because of our outside schedules, because of interruptions in our life, because of our own lack of commitment. And we can slow the momentum down. So we have to be careful, not only of discouraging words that people try to throw out there as, as, as breaks to our momentum, but also to the fact that sometimes there are parts in our, of our body, of our church body, that come to a screeching halt, that, that uh, get sick by way of schedule and other conflicts and lack of commitment. And for us to maintain momentum, it's not that we can't let all those things happen, because discouragement's going to happen. People are going to have to step out of their volunteer position. But what we've got to do is be aware of that so that we can step in, so that we can keep going, so that we don't lose momentum, okay? Now, I've been back six weeks. Out of the six months, I said we're going to be difficult. And so we're just six weeks into this, six weeks into rebuilding, six weeks into regaining and improving and pushing on to our momentum. We're nowhere near uh, the finish of this story. But we will have and continue to have and have had uh, these obstacles that want to slow us down. Maybe even in your own life, uh, things are, are, are being brought, frictions being brought into your life that makes you even question your commitment to church and to serve. But be aware, my friends, that happens to all of us. None of us are exempt from that. Uh, we all get discouraged when we uh, hear discouraging things said. Uh, we all get distracted by the other busyness of life and we'll even go so far as to prioritize that over our commitment to God. But being aware of that, being aware of all of the letters that were later written helps those Israelites be encouraged to maintain their momentum. And we need to be encouraged to keep going. Let's don't stop yet. All right? Uh, our worship is wonderful. I know because I visited during the January when I was out, I visited some big churches. I wouldn't trade what they had for what we have here for anything. Okay, That's not self-serving. That's just the truth. Uh, we do good. Uh, we love each other. We uh, are concerned about each other. Uh, uh, our prayer chain and our prayer needs uh, uh, just go out far and wide and people respond and follow up and visit. Uh, it, it's an awesome thing. Let's keep that momentum going. Okay? Let, let's don't let events uh, uh, that, that try to disrail God's purpose and plan for this church succeed in doing that at all, but rather let's just grease this track and keep going. Let's realize that whatever uphills that God may be sending us through it's just because well, there's a top of the hill coming. And there's a downhill rush that God has in front of us. And what is true of us as a church, again, is so true of us as an individual. When you're going through a difficult time, and I guess maybe most of us at any one time are going through a difficult uphill struggle in our life, 
Let's now look at that as the roller coaster that it is. That we are getting to the top in order that God can use that difficult experience of our life to give us the blessing of that downhill part of that ride. That God will never leave us abandoned. And we read on TV, uh, there'll be uh, these roller coasters will come to a stop someplace and they have to get out there and rescue everybody. God doesn't leave us abandoned. He makes sure that we can finish the course. Our job, let's maintain that momentum. Let's keep going through. Let's realize that God is in charge of the paths and the directions of this church and of our family, of our career, of our relationships in life. And let's don't look at the difficulties we're going through as anything but God preparing us for the great blessings to come. There would not be blessings. There wouldn't be this downhill coast if there wasn't the uphill to go through first. Some Two people can experience the same things in life, the same blessings in life. But the one who preceded that blessing with a difficult time is going to see that blessing far greater and enjoy it far more than the one who just slid into it. Those of you who are going through difficult times in your lives right now, and I mean right now, understand that God is simply pushing you uphill for the great blessing that is to come. You, if you are a child of God, He chastises us. He grows us and He trains us. And He does so in order that He can use us mightily for Him. So let's don't jump off the, the track. Let's don't put on the brakes. Let's don't say, boy, I wish I, wish I, I was just back sitting still, a body at rest again. No, let's keep it moving. Let's don't allow that friction. The, the difference between us and that red ball going down the aisle is that we have God to keep pushing us. We have God to empower us. So much so that no resistance, no pressure can stop us if we'll allow God and His momentum to be maintained in our life. That's what the Israelites did. When you go to chapter 5, which we will next week, you're going to see a fresh start. You're going to see people that face their opposition and said, hey, wait a minute. We're here because God wants us to do something. And we need to do what God has asked us to do. And we're not going to let this opposition stop us. And we're going to keep our momentum going. We're not going to just go so far and settle for it to be half built. And that's where God is with us, I think. He wants us to see and have this fresh start. This whole series is called New Beginnings. That we start new with God to do the great things that He wants us to do. Now if you're here with us this morning and you're uh, not a member of our church, and some of this may seem uh, a, a bit outside of, of uh, your understanding, but let me, let me just share with you that you're at one of those points in your life. You may be that that ball that's just sitting there, not moving. And it may be that God is speaking to your heart today that it's time for you to do great things for Him. He's ready to, to, to give you that initial push that you need to serve Him. That may come in rededicating your life. That may come in, in worshiping and bowing and praying before Him and letting Him be the Lord of your life. And no longer the other things like your pride and, and like your schedule that stand between you and the worship of God. And it may be that this morning He's calling on you to come and to, to join uh, with us, to come and to profess Christ as your Savior, to come and to follow Him in the ordinance of baptism. To, to get that ball rolling in your life, to serving Him. It may be that you're here this morning and maybe you've been a member for a long time and God is speaking to you today and He's saying don't lose heart. Don't let that momentum ebb. All that you've been through, God is using for the blessings and the opportunities of service that lay right in front of you. And don't put on the brakes now. 